So while you're taking your seats, let me welcome you to the session, uh, Think Small, Big Ideas from Small Countries. My name is Lawrence Chalup. I'm professor of sport management at George Mason University, the immediate past president of the North American Society for Sport Management and a member of their executive council. And we are very pleased with the North American Society for Sport Management to be a partner with Project Play in pursuing the objectives of improving youth sport throughout this country. Today's session is Think Small, Big Ideas from Small Countries. And uh, before we proceed with uh, I'll inter my introductions of the panelists and the panelists' presentations, we have a short video clip um, on thinking creatively about play, trying to make us learn from what Thailand is doing uh, with uh, small courts. So we'll proceed with the uh, video.เดี๋ยวผมจะไปรุ่นเนี่ยเค้ามีความสนใจอยากจะออกมาแสดงหรือออกมาใช้ความสามารถของเค้าแต่ว่าเวลาที่เค้าไม่มีพื้นที่แบ
So in one generation, you turned it around, and as I understand it, it had a lot to do with how you focused on grassroots development. Can you share with us what happened in Norway and what lessons you think we might take away from that? Yeah, I think it's two things that are really important to mention. Uh, I think it became a game changer when we got the Winter Olympics to Norway and Lillehammer in 1994. So when the International Olympic Committee decided Lillehammer, a really small city uh, not far away from Oslo, then uh, we started after zero gold medals in Calgary 88 and only five medals, we started a totally new uh, project, building up new coaches, new leaders, and a new generation of athletes. Uh, I was at that time only 24 years old, so I have been into this travel from that time, and I was then national coach uh, in this whole period in, in the 90s. And then the second uh, thing is that in, in 87, the General Assembly of the Norwegian Confederation of Sport and the Norwegian Olympic Committee, they uh, they created a document called the Children Rights in Sport. Uh, so, and the aim with that is to not do any selection uh, of children uh, before they are 16, 17 years. That it's a right for all children and all youth in Norway to take part of, of sport. And in the Norwegian Confederation of Sport, half of the population is member in, in the Norwegian Confederation of Sport and the Norwegian Olympic Committee. You know, we are, only, we are only five million people living in Norway, and we are the most winning country uh, in the history in the Winter Olympics. But we are also quite strong in Summer Olympics. So the change was to develop in to, to really build on knowledge, to build a holistic sport model. And, uh, and, and also one thing that is different from Norway to United States is, you know, we have 12,000 sports clubs. Also all our sports is organized in the clubs and it's voluntary based. So it's more or less free to participate in sport from when you are a little kid. So tell us a little more about, about how you thought about the ways you would support your club base and particularly the young athletes as they developed uh, as part of that overall holistic vision that you had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the most, the most important is to take care of the kids <laughs> that they are feeling well when they are coming into the club. Also, uh, to, to create them and treat them uh, as what they are. They are not young adults, they are children. And, that, uh, and I think the most important thing to bring up this uh, young girls and boys is that they are building a friendship through sport, that they find their friends and uh, building uh, the joy, find the joy of sport in, in young age, uh, then uh, we will have, as a, we, we, can, we cannot lose these children. China with 1.4 1, 1. billion, uh, United States with uh, 100 million people. We are only 5 million people, we can't lose them. We have to take care of them. And therefore, uh, therefore um, it is to build the joy of sport and not, and not do too early specialized training that they can choose, that they can do a lot of sports. And uh, you know, in Norway, it's not, it's not allowed to have wrestled lists uh, before you are 13 years. And if you are participating in a competition when you are 9, 10, 10 11 years, it's prizes for all the kids. 
that is regulated in this uh, in this uh, children rights uh, of sports interesting focus on on using your children as your base and building from there very interesting listen before we move on I wanted to mention that we're even though we're just getting started uh, we're going to be taking questions via Slido uh, dot com. Uh, enter hashtag project play and select the seventh floor to submit questions you may have. You can also upvote a question you like that someone else asked and we'll try to select those that are particularly popular. Um, our Slido moderator will ask a couple at the end of the session. We'll also continue this conversation afterwards for those of you who want to continue talking about these issues and speaking with these gentlemen in our continuing conversation. Uh, in addition, you can tweet to at Aspen Institute Sports and at hashtag Project Play. Um, so let me turn now to Patrick. Patrick, with Portis Consulting, you guys have done some really interesting work around the world in places like Saudi Arabia and the like. Tell us a little bit about what Portis Consulting is doing and what you think some of the lessons are from this world experience that you've been gaining. Yeah, sure, Lawrence. And then um, first, just want to say thank you for that. And it's really exciting to be here and part of such a, a great event. Uh, so Portis Consulting is a global strategy consulting firm. We're focused on sports and physical activity. Our mission in a similar way to Aspen is to help society by getting people active and getting people playing sports. Over the years, we've had the privilege to fulfill this mission by working with senior leaders across the world in national governments, in sporting organizations for over 20 sports, for two Olympic organizing committees and for several large corporates. One of our key focus areas is on youth sports and physical activity. And as Lawrence said, we've had the kind of luck and privilege to do some really exciting work around the world in this space. Now, youth sports is something that is really important to me. I think when, when Tom was talking earlier, I kind of could see myself in that kid who found himself on the outside of sports growing up. I was always tall for my age, and my coordination was pretty slow to develop, and I missed a, lot of, missed a lot of opportunities growing up. And the work that we do, I think, is great because it helps kids really take those opportunities. I think two of the examples I'd love to talk to you about today, one is some, some really fascinating work we're doing in Saudi Arabia, really transforming the physical activity habits of the younger generation. And the second one is we're working with uh, some cities across the world doing some really groundbreaking work through our initiative called ACW, which stands for Active Citizens Worldwide, that's aiming to get millions more young people active in cities around the world. If I start with Saudi Arabia, so Saudi Arabia is a really fascinating place at the moment. Uh, it's in the news for a lot of reasons, but a really positive story to tell is around the change that's going on there with youth sports. For those who don't know, Saudi Arabia is a country really undergoing tremendous change and really at an unparalleled pace. And this is both economic change as well as social change. Um, so to give you some examples, in the time that I've been working in there this year, I watched a film in one of the first cinemas to open there in more than 35 years. I was driven to work by one of the first women to ever drive a car there, <laughs> or at least legally. Um, and I've had the privilege to work with some of the men and women who are really leading this change. So why is youth sports such an important topic for Saudi Arabia? So firstly, Saudi Arabia is in the midst of a real health crisis. Around one in three adults are obese and around one in five young people are obese. And more than one in six people will die of premature death due to non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes. So for context, this is around double the rate of countries such as Norway. And those numbers are really growing fast. Secondly, Saudi Arabia is one of the youngest countries in the world. Around one in three Saudi citizens are under 15. So back when we started supporting them in 2015, there were some real challenges in the sports sector. There was no overall policy for youth sports. And secondly, it was a country where 
physical, active, physical inactivity was just the norm. Only 13% of people did any form of sports or physical activity, even once a week. So fast forwarding to three years later to today, and I'm glad to say there's been a real sea change. Firstly, youth sports is now a core part of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030. And there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people being active. So it now stands at 23%. So to reiterate, that's going from 13% in 2015 to 23% just three years later. So that equates to around 1 million more people being active. And the vision is to go even further. It's to go to 40% of adults by 2030 and actually 80% of under 15s by 2030. Achieving this will have some really clear economic, social and health benefits for all the young people in Saudi Arabia. So this has been a really tremendous achievement, I think, for that country. And reflecting on it, and keeping in mind that there are obvious differences between the US and Saudi, I think there are probably kind of three points that might be relevant for the US to consider. Firstly, vision. So Saudi Arabia set a very clear and compelling vision, and specifically for grassroots sports. So mass participation in non-competitive sports. And I think setting that vision and actually putting some clear numbers behind it has been a real driver for change. Secondly, it's around accountability. So Saudi Arabia, I think like most countries in the world, knew that getting kids active is a good thing to do, generally speaking. But three years ago, like, most many, like a lot of countries in the world today, there was no organization or organizations with actual accountability to make that happen. So in response, we set up a new government entity called the Mass Participation Federation and gave that entity accountability to actually deliver those targets. <coughs> and I think <coughs> creating that organization <coughs> and actually equipping it with the funding and the mandate to make that happen has been a real game changer. Thirdly, Saudi Arabia has been very proactive in looking around the world and really finding the best practices for youth sports and physical activity and bringing those into Saudi Arabia. And I think that's also been a real point of difference. Well, that speaks nicely to what we're doing in this panel, actually, start looking around the world and see what we can take forward. And carrying that forward, Matt, if, you know, you've been involved in a number of countries, and particularly, in, of course, in your home country, Canada, in, um, in sport development and uh, working on, on enhancing sports systems, particularly for youth. <coughs> Can you share with us some of what your work has been doing and what we might take away from that? Yeah, thanks for, uh, to just continue what Patrick is saying, you know, our area of, of expertise and preference is around that accountability piece um, because it's one thing to have the information and education, but if we're really gonna drive change, we need to drill down into the activation and, and accountability strategies as well. And we often overlook those. Um, they, be, they become kind of Marcom, uh, uh, we were talking earlier, Marcom issues where people go, okay, we got this, we're gonna do this great campaign. Uh, and they're great and campaigns are great, but how do we actually drill down into making sure that we're following through on what we're delivering? So that's really what we focus on in Canada. We've had some great discussion in, in Australia and New Zealand, different things that are happening. But I would say in Canada, the three things that are going really well are the uh, diversity focus, the inclusive focus, inclusion, and the fair play. And that is not to swing the pendulum from high performance uh, all the way to kind of high fives and handshakes. It's actually to say you will have more high performance when you have greater experiences at the beginning, which is why we're all here and what this is all about. So one of the things that we focus on is how do we actually make sure that what we are advocating, that what we are campaigning is actually taking place at the grassroots level, at the appropriate levels. How are we engaging the different stakeholders, um, which include not just the sport organizations, but the athletes, which we often overlook, um, the parents, the teachers, and the education system, the coaches, and the sport organizations. How do we bring those all together to have uh, you know, common nomenclature so that we're not uh, selling something different and, and communicating different messages to different stakeholders? 
that's really what you know, we're trying to do. Canada has done a really good job at coming out with their LTAD model and, and going around the world. Um, but the opportunity for us lies really in, in, in consistency in the activation in our own country, which can lead to some of the best practices that we're talking about here and translate nicely to other countries as well. Well, let's, can we just follow up on that for a minute? I mean, you mentioned long-term athlete development, and you, and you also talked about um, setting up basically marketing programs, but not carrying forward at all, for figuring out how to carry forward to the activations so that we're actually putting programming into place that follows up on the, on the marketing communications that we have in, in place. Can you share with us a little bit about, about what, what you find it works and, and, and what some of the potential stumbling blocks might be to make sure that things, so we know what we need to do to make it work? Yeah, uh, we like to refer to the sports spine. So <coughs> starting at discovery and leading to either high performance or recreation, who's all in line with that sports spine and, and the different stakeholders that come off that. So as we move through free and risky play, that's parent engagement, fundamental movement skills is, is early childhood education engagement, fundamental sports skills in the secondary school level. Uh, and then getting right up to the policy level, and one of the things that we have a, uh, that we've done a good job in Canada is is the research, the R and D that goes around these things to say is this actually working or not? Um, you know, let's get black and white. We don't get hung up on the research only, um, but we actually try to say, okay, this is this is all of our space. Who's in whose space is this? Whose vertical <coughs> is this? But let's make sure that we're all talking along uh, the sports spine, so there's alignment all the way up and down. But I think that's one of the things that's really supported the accountability because everyone likes the data, everyone likes the scientific evidence, everyone likes to research around it to make sure that what we're espousing should happen and will happen actually does. Yeah, that, that, that's really, so, so the partnership that you have in Canada between the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council and Sport Canada, are you finding that that's something we might want to be thinking about in the United States as, as, as building a partnership maybe between our federal research agencies and our sport systems, uh, which we haven't done yet? Yeah, that, Lo lo that? loaded question, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, gr a great opportunity to do that because uh, otherwise, who's in charge, what's happening, and, and do we still have these disparate silos, um, but we're not coming together on a collective manner. Um, it's harder to do than in Norway because it's a smaller country. Uh, it's definitely harder to do in a country like Saudi Arabia where if they tell you what to do, you're going to do it, but it's just absolutely something that we need to consider if we want to move from where we are to where we need to get to. That's a nice response to my loaded question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Ingo, can I come back to you for then it, this issue of, of you talked about working through the clubs and, and the strength of your club system and the volunteer system, and yet you also are funding that system, as I understand it, through some sports betting and sports gambling revenues. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of a, of a club system as you guys experience it, volunteer labor and, and funding? Yeah, of course. Um, I think uh, most of the sport in uh, Norway is founded through uh, the municipalities or uh, the government. And, um, and uh, especially the elite sport and also a part of uh, the, um, uh, the money from uh, the state uh, lottery is going to the clubs. So of course that is giving that has given us over quite many years a sustainable um, uh, economic fundament uh, to to um, to support uh, the sport. But but I will say that most of the work in the clubs are voluntary based. But of course. We are living in a modern world and many of us uh, have taken an education in a university and we have sport also as a professional work. So to develop uh, the whole model, to the develop the whole system, you need also high competence people. So uh, it is a key here that you find a good cooperation between the professional workers, those who have education and all the parents that are doing the voluntary work in the clubs. Um, but I, I think it's, I, I just want us to, to say that um, uh, it is important to try to keep 
the kids as long as possible into the sport because also in this modern work and all of you are sitting with an iPhone or iPad uh, and in this tech technology part of the world it's important that more than ever that the kids are co going out so so uh, that is also an important part of our culture in Norway that is uh, the outdoor life is still alive. So you have to say to, uh, to the kids, and we also, uh, as adults, we have sometimes to take free <coughs> from all the technology and open the door and just go out and do our sport. Because sport is physical education. Uh, and uh, and uh, still it is important for kids to meet other kids and meet other adults in a sport field, uh, to have a communication as, as normal people and not only communicate through all these uh, devices. Very that is really, really important. And I think we, you, have to s you have to place the sport into the whole development of a society and sport in itself is one of the best education e arena uh, to learn skills and how you are treated uh, other people and build respect uh, through the sport. And when we are going to the Olympic Games, then we are a team and these skills and this behavior, those our, our world champions or Olympic champions, they have learned this from they were kids. So it's totally natural when you're coming to Olympic Games that you are helping each other. So it's important that it's not, I say, a load to take a step out of that uh, fellowship. You have to be a part of it and the best athletes has to give back to, you, to the young athletes. Well, there's a lot to think about here across all of our speakers. Um, let's uh, open it up to questions submitted via Slido. Do we have some questions? Yes, so questions are going to come from back here. Hi. <laughs> um, the first question is can you speak to how your countries are including youth with disabilities at the grassroots level? Well, Inga, why don't you start with that? Because your systems, don't you? Uh, dis youth with disabilities, how do you integrate them at the grassroots level? The, 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 the disability. Right, the dis yeah, athletes with disabilities. Because your programs actually do integrate them quite well, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, we have a, that is in a good question. Also, we are, we are one sport organization and the whole name is the Norwegian Olympic and Paralympic and Special Olympic Committee and Confederation of Sport. So I think that is also say something of the whole way of living and the whole philosophy in, in, in Norway. And, uh, and we take care of all uh, those who are participating in in, in Paralympics and those who have intellectual disabilities, they are a normal part of the whole sport movement and they are also a sport part of, to, uh, of the sport clubs. So it is, in, in our elite sports center in Oslo, it is the same leadership for those who are participating in Special Olympics and those who are participating in uh, the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang and next time in Tokyo. Interesting. So in terms of the other countries, how do you, how do you uh, handle the um, integration between Paralympic and Special Olympic and, uh, and able-bodied athletes? What, do you, what, what, do you, what, do you, what are you finding? Um, yes, I think it's a great question. I think speaking from probably both actually the UK and Saudi Arabia, I think what what's important to get that right is really just making it an explicit focus area. So for example, when you are running surveys, 
uh, to understand kind of what participation activities are, what behaviours are, just making sure that you focus on that segment of society when doing that. And then I think secondly, kind of in Saudi Arabia's case, that vision they set around mass participation, they also set specific goals for the different segments of society and then linked funding to national sporting organisations back to those goals. So I think that's really important for making it just a priority area. In Canada, how have we funded? How, how have we supported it? Not well at all. Um, unfortunately, we've had uh, y you know the the environments are not conducive to to uh, incorporating and, and making it, creating an inclusive situation, uh, and our our educators have not been educated um, or taken the steps to to make that happen. It, it is starting to change now, which at the top is why we said uh, it's exciting because that's th a new push. Uh, for inclusion, it's gotten better, but uh, to date we have not handled it very well. Um, they've been they've been very separate. And you're working to overcome that now. Yeah, I'd say the st the, the biggest start is that that we see is the built environments. Um, so having the accessibility um, to sure. the, to the spaces, uh, to the the gyms, the clubs, the facilities, etc. Um, and that's a big start because if there's no accessibility, you're not even getting you're not even getting started. Have we got time for one more? Yes. We do. Please. Um, the second question, which is up, is how does socialized medicine in Norway impact the sporting experience for children or the public at large? How does the socialized medicine in Norway impact the That's children? The social. public, socialized medicine impact the children and, and the system? Oh, if, if I understand the question right, um, Also, the the, so, the social m medicine you, you asked. <laughs> I think uh, I have to say we are living in a social democratic country, and uh, more or less every year, United Nations they we are on the top of the list uh, in the world. Uh, to, to be the best country to live in. And I think that says quite a lot of the equalness. Also, it's not only the right to, to participate in sport, of course, the right to... Uh, to all, all the kids in Norway have the same rights to go to a school, to, um, uh, to have the rights uh, of health care, and this, I think this equalness, thinkness, is the most important also in the social medicine. And, um, and, um, and um, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't say it in, an, an, in another way. Uh, and it's building on uh, res respect uh, of each other. It's don't play any role. How much money you have? How much money you have? It, it has to do with who, who who you are, and where is your place in in the team? Um, and I think this thinking and this way of living is so natural for us. Uh, it is uh, it is developed uh, through generations, and. Um, yeah, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you, you can say then it's an interesting question why we are so good in sport because in Norway the kids and the adults they have more or less everything. So if you compare with uh, for example the east of Europe or China where to be a good in sport uh, it gives you a possibility. But in Norway we have the platform, but although uh, the inner motivation and the fun to do sport and to the fun to be a part of this society and a part of this team, that is the most important force to develop this performance 
in sport, sport and also in, bis in, in business life. It's not a big difference than that. So it opens up a social motivation and beyond just a, what can I achieve for myself. Yeah. So, so Patrick and Matt, you both are, you know, are based in countries that also have medicine systems that are uh, medical systems that have a socialized aspect. Have you reflected on this with reference to sport and what, what the contribution is of, of that particular system? Um, so I think one interesting thing that's emerging in the UK and is also emerging in other countries such as New Zealand, Sweden uh, and Singapore to name a few is actually making sports part of the solution to health management plans. So it's something kind of an interesting model that's emerging is countries increasingly trying to empower their uh, health sectors to be able to prescribe sports and physical activity as part of a young person's kind of response to a health issue. And I think those, it's kind of a still an emerging topic, but something that shows real promise. So in New Zealand, for example, where they've been running a program for around two or three years, uh, a kid who's participated in this program shows an average increase of 64 minutes per week increase in physical activity after a couple of years. So I think that's something that I think is a really important growing area. Do you want to add anything, Matt? Yeah, we're very blessed in Canada to have um, a similar, similar social system. So, and, and I would love to see it go that way. Uh, instead of operating health, education, uh, everyone in their silos, it would be great. Wouldn't it be fantastic if they got together and, uh, and we moved in a common direction? But we were very lucky and fortunate. And it does create um, that, that inclusion from that sense, um, no doubt. So that's a, that's a great place to wrap up. I want to thank our panelists for the conversation. Uh, the next strategy session here on the seventh floor will be train all coaches. Can a free tool change the game? And on the eighth floor, revitalize in-town leagues, the promise of mixed gender play. Or if you want to keep this conversation going, you can head to the continuing conversation room in the main hallway of this floor. That's room 709.2. And our panelists and I will be there for you to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Look forward to interacting with you for the rest of the day.